If you could take a seat, we're about to start. Well, Croeso Canesichi, I Uithnos, Duidianai Creadigal, Duivila Gindegoith, Dros a Peduar Durnod Nesav, Edrachunum Lime, Ichdar Parichi, Gedar Haglen Gefrois, Akadus Giadol, Ganganuis Guithdai, Kavluniadai, Achavueliadai, and Ruyol. Nod hin oll yw darparu cyfarwydd wedi chi ar sut i weithio y myd y diwydiannau creadigol ac i gefnogi eich datblygiad proffesiynol. Wel, mae gynna ni fore prysur iawn ond blaenau ni a bydd sesiwn y bore yma yn cael eu dorri i dwy ran. Mi fyddaf yn trosglwyddo'r awenau yn y man i isganghellor prifysgol glendwr yr athro Maria Hinfela a fydd yn eich croesawu chi yn swyddogol y bore yma. Yn dilyn hynny, bydd pennaeth ysgol y celfyddydau creadigol, yr athro Alex Shepley yn datgan pwysigrwydd yr wythnos yma. Yna mi fyddwn yn croesawu Joe Marsh, cyfarwyddwr creadigol tu pawb Wrexham, i amlinellu datblygiadau celfyddydol allweddol fydd yn cymeryd lle yma yn Wrexham dros y misoedd, yr wythnosau a'r blynyddod sydd i ddod. Mi fydd yna egwyl byr am un ar ddeg ac yna am chwarter wedi un ar ddeg byddwn yn croesawu ein prif siaradwr y bor yma, Shani Rhys James, MBE. A very warm welcome to you to Creative Futures Week 2018. Over the next four days, we look forward to providing an inspiring and informative programme of presentations, workshops and interviews to help you understand more about the creative industries and to support your ongoing professional development. We have a very busy first morning ahead and today's opening session will be split into two parts. Um, in a minute, I will hand over to our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Maria Hinfela, who will provide the opening welcome address. Professor Hinfela will be followed by the head of the School of Creative Arts, Professor Alec Shepley who will talk to you about the importance of Creative Futures Week. We will then welcome Joe Marsh, the Creative Director from TPOW, to outline some of the key developments happening in the arts in Wrexham. A short break will follow at around 11, and then about quarter past 11, we have our keynote address from renowned Welsh painter, Shani Rhys James, MBE. Felly, mae nawr yn bleser gen i alw ar ein isganghellor, yr athro Maria Hinfela, i agor yr wythnos yn swyddogol. So I'm very pleased to introduce Prof Professor Maria Hinfela, our Vice-Chancellor, to officially open our week. Ellen Mai. Thank you, Ellen Mai. Welcome to the 2018 edition of Creative Futures. This annual event showcases the best opportunities for employability or for starting your own business in the creative industry sectors. There are some fantastic speakers lined up who will inspire and entertain, and plenty of workshops for students to be actively engaged. This year, 2018, Rexham Lindu University celebrates its 10th anniversary as a university. In 2008, following an arduous process, the then First Minister of Wales, Frodi Morgan, made that announcement right here in the William Aston Hall. But our history goes back much further than that. As far back as the late 19th century, 
arts and science courses were offered by our predecessor colleges. In fact, in the 1930s, the Regent Street campus, which now houses our, many of our arts and design courses, was the main campus of this organization. Because this campus, the campus of Plas Cos, where we are today, was only opened in 1953. We still have some old photos, old black and white photos, of chemistry cl classes taking place in Regent Street, can you imagine? So that they, they were very, very different days and times have moved on. So back to today, we're focusing on your future, not on the past. I'd like to thank our career service, particularly Neil Pritchard, the School of Creative Arts team, and all our guest speakers for giving up their time to put on this outstanding program for you. Make the most of it, enjoy it. It should be a memorable week, which will help you along your way towards a successful and creative career. Thank you. I'd like to hand over to Alex Sheffield. everybody, Borajar, warm welcome to you all, to all the students, the staff and to our special guests to the School of Creative Arts, Wrexham Glyndor University and of course to Creative Futures Week 2018. My name is Alex Sheffley and uh, welcome to my talk, Owning and Loving Your Creative Future. I have to confess that I stole that uh, from the uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, who's very keen on us owning and loving things. And I thought, what a great way of starting the, the week. The idea really um, is for you to use this week in any way you can. It's really great to see so many of you here today. And I just want to start by stating or restating my belief in the importance of the arts and creativity in education per se. As we shall see, it's a vital component of our socio-economic well-being. And in this session, I'm going to say a few words on the importance of you visualizing your own creative future, imagining where you want to be. The week comprises some 50 or 60 separate events with nearly 70 presenters, and that's not even including all of the introducers, helpers, and guides. It all adds up to over 60 hours of live session time and probably an infinite number of connections made by you during the week thinking about your own futures. So it's intense, it's quite a phenomenal effort. So I just want to pause briefly for everybody in the room just to say thank you to Neil Pritchard and his uh, associates from Careers who've worked tirelessly to make this week happen and have made it happen every week for the past few years. So thank you, Neil. It's, uh, it also warms your hands up a bit. This is a really important week for us all, and over time, Creative Futures Week has come to occupy a special place in our annual calendar. It's a time where we come together for four days solid to exchange ideas, to engage with practice and the idea of employment beyond the realms of the institution, it's a time when we engage with one another, experience different perspectives, some familiar, some less so. And it's by orchestrating event-based learning like this that we encounter the new and help one another imagine where we would like to be in, say, five years' time and ask ourselves some searching questions, set our bearings and plot a course for success ask ourselves, what does my future look like? What does it feel like? What does success look like to me? What kind of things will I be doing? What kinds of things do I want to be doing? What do I love doing? Can I make a living from that? If not in total, then perhaps in part. In other words, this is a time when we focus on helping you to own and love your creative future. We're a connected community and exchanging ideas, ideas that compete with one another, 
is one way of securing these bonds in our creative community. Indeed, this process is vital. And my talk really addresses three main themes. The first is around context, and it's to provide you with some important detail about the creative industry sector, and in particular, the Welsh context. The second is ambition, our thinking, and how we are going to do this as a school, how it fits with this whole, er whole area of the creative community, the creative economy, employability, and I've got some concrete examples of graduate success to show you. And the third theme is really around questioning, questions about why we're doing all of this, our collective motivation, and what is yet to be achieved. And all of this is for you to take away and reflect upon as you move along through the week and the rest of your course and careers. And by the way, this lecture will appear on Moodle for you to follow up at your leisure, and there are some links on there as well for you to follow up. <laughs> Excuse me for sniffling, by the way. So what are the creative industries? We hear this phrase quite a lot, but has anybody actually explained what it all is? The term culture industry was actually coined quite some time ago in 1944 by the critical theorist Theodore Adorno, who proposed that popular culture is akin to a factory producing standardized cultural goods, films, radio programs, magazines, etc. He had some interesting views about how this process could be used by market forces to manipulate mass society into passivity but I feel things have moved on to a situation where the world is not merely reflected by the arts, where the arts are merely products for consumption, but in many ways are actually now forming and informing the world, as well as making a significant economic and social contribution to quite challenging economic conditions. Throw in new technologies into that mix alongside traditional art forms, and you've got a very potent mix indeed. So you can see why people like Adorno theorized that this phenomenon of mass culture and cultural production more widely had political implications, ones that stir interest in governments and politicians the world over today. But let's get back to the point of this week. The term creative industries began to be used about 20 years ago to describe a range of activities, some of which are amongst the oldest in history and some of which only came into existence with the advent of digital technology. Many of these activities had strong cultural roots and the term cultural industries was already in use, as I've said, to describe things like theater, dance, music, film, the visual arts and the heritage sector Although this term itself was controversial, as many artists felt it demeaning to think of what they did as being in any way an industry. The first attempt to measure the value of the creative industries came back in 1997, when a newly elected Labour government in the UK decided, helpfully I might add, to attempt a definition and assess their direct impact on the British economy. Drawing on a study published in 1994 by the Australian government, Creative Nation, and on the advice of an invited group of leading creative entrepreneurs, the government's new Department for Culture, Media and Sport published Creative Industries Mapping Document in 1998. That listed 13 areas of activity, advertising, architecture, the arts and antiques markets, crafts, design, designer fashion, film, interactive leisure software, music, performing arts, publishing, software, television and radio, which had in common the fact that they have their origin in individual creativity, skill and talent, and have a potential for wealth creation through the generation of intellectual property. The concept of intellectual property was seen as central to any understanding of creative industries and continues to do so today. But the lack of a transparent process for identifying which industries and occupations should be classified as creative 
and which should not meant that the classifications lacked accuracy at that time, for example, missing out large numbers of freelancers working as designers and artists in the sectors not regarded as creative or in new and emerging industries such as video games or game art. This is significant as many of you will become freelancers and portfolio workers for some time after graduation and it's important for government to recognize this phenomenon. Not least because the lack of a transparent method for classifying creative industries and occupations held back the development of any international standard, resulting in different classifications being used in different countries. To address this, the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts, or NESTA for short, which is an independent charity that works to increase the innovation capacity of the UK through research and practical partnerships, developed something called dynamic mapping, in which creative roles were defined as those which deploy cognitive skills to bring about novelty, whose final form cannot be fully specified in advance. Sound familiar? I'm sure you would agree that this final element, that of unpredictability or unknowingness, a faith in something that we might not yet know but trust to is really important. I would say it's essential and core to our being as creatives. Capitalizing on the chance happening, the happy accident, the wrong turn or even failure and how new learning can come from that are all vital. As you will no doubt discover, this is a much sought after skill in the world of employment as evidenced in our destination of lever statistics, which are high, by the way. But be in no doubt how valuable your skill in these areas is. In the dynamic mapping report, Nestor's emergent methodology enabled them to identify as creative industries those with exceptionally high creative intensities. They looked at those working within the creative industries and those working in creative jobs, but in sectors outside of the creative industries. And if you look at their website, you can interact with this dynamic mapping model or a version of it and find out where the jobs hotspots are in the UK and our region and which are the key sectors and skill sets. And what this methodology showed was that there are a small number of industries in the UK whose workforce included a very high proportion of people working in creative occupations, often 30 or 40 percent, but in some cases 80 or even 90 percent, whilst the vast majority of other industries only had a creative intensity of about 3 percent. So in 2014, the DCMS adopted the main principles of the dynamic mapping framework and with this more transparent and robust methodology, the UK's Office for National Statistics agreed to give what had previously been informal estimates of the country's creative workforce an official stamp of approval. This was a turning point as it made it possible to get a much better understanding of the geography of the UK's creative economy workforce and to do so on a basis consistent with how other parts of the economy were measured. So, for example, it was possible to show that in 2013, 43% of the UK's creative economy workforce was employed in London and the southeast of England, compared with 32% of the high-tech economy workforce and just 28% of the workforce as a whole. But what about the Welsh context? Well, at the last count, there are about 84,000 people who work in the creative economy in Wales, according to these statistics from 2015. Of these, nearly, nearly 53,000 work in the creative industries and around 31,000 work in creative occupations outside and around the creative industries. So they're related jobs. The creative industries is one of the fastest growing sectors in Wales. 
the Creative Industries Sector Panel Chair, Ron Jones, stated recently, the creative industries today are central to the lives of people and businesses around the world. New business models have emerged in recent years, enabling individuals and small companies to compete with the largest and the best. This is now a sector where Wales has no commercial or technological disadvantage. We are constrained only by our talent, our ambition and our determination. And the Welsh Government's priority is therefore to provide the support and guidance to ensure that no talent is unfulfilled and no marketable creative idea is wasted, quote unquote. So there you have it, government ambition, government support for our industry into the future. This next slide just puts the creative industries within the wider economy of Wales. It just contextualizes it. You can see that it accounts for about 6% of enterprises and about 4% of all employment. So it's already a significant piece of the jigsaw. I'm just going to talk over this film. It's important to note that alongside the emergence of this increasingly defined sector of the creative industries has been the rapid growth of the digital realm and the idea of the fourth industrial revolution, both in terms of the specialist tools and techniques, media and processes, but also the advent of digital connectivity. But more on that later. This facet of our sector's future and yours has not been lost on government, nor our own growth plan as a school and as a university. And Campus 2025 signifies an important milestone on that journey. This aspect of culture, the digital, came to overshadow for a time the idea of craft or the handmade. But I think it's now seen as something to be seen alongside. Despite all the talk of artificial intelligence, the human touch, being human, is important once again and a vital component of the digital age, the age of the Anthropocene and the age of the fourth industrial revolution. The Digital Innovation Fund for the Arts in Wales is supporting arts organisations such as Nesta and the Arts Council Wales to develop digital solutions and to some of the challenges and opportunities our society faces. And this brings me on to what our contribution is. In September just gone, School of Creative Arts here at Wrexham Glyndor University, supported by the home institution, commenced a joint funded collaborative research project with Mostyn in Llandidno, exploring the effects of the digital on artistic production, but also on curation, on educational programming and on audience experience. And this month saw the launch, launch of our second in the series of joint funded projects linking the arts to other sectors of our economy, this time a joint funded full-time research studentship with Betsa Cadwallada University Health Board, exploring the positive benefits of the arts in health and well-being. We're really pleased to announce this is now scheduled to start in March and we're in talks with regional arts organisations to develop further funded studentships in key areas such as the arts and society, community, technology, curatorial practice, amongst others. We have been conducting research in the area of arts and health for some time in our school, with several research outputs already, and another PhD in this is now almost complete. Our activities are not as widely known as I or my colleagues would like. So following a conversation with myself and my own creative future, I determined to speak out much more and to continue to shout about us at every opportunity, about our students, about you, about our staff, our work, and to continue as an advocate for the technical and creative work that is being produced here. And this is not just about the postgraduate research level. There are even more exemplars from the undergraduate programmes 
And here are just a few. Ewan Vaughan graduated from the BA Theatre TV and Performance recently and is now a successful Welsh actor. He said, the course built my understanding of the arts and acting from nothing to being able to thrive in a professional environment. Since starting my professional career, I have realized how apt the course is to get you ready for that plunge into the industry, quote unquote. Is currently appearing as Jason on the Welsh S4C soap Round Around since January 2017. But he has already built up quite an impressive repertoire of roles since graduating from here, including documentaries, stage, TV roles, educational work, and more recently, directing. So we're building upon a strong history of notable artists and designers who have studied here in the past, like, for example, the painter, president of the Royal Cambrian Academy and keeper of the Royal Academy of Schools, the late Maurice Cockrell. Or Ben Johnson, whose Liverpool panorama hung in the World Museum in Liverpool. And with us this week, I'm pleased to say, we have more recent fine art graduates and graduates from other courses within the school, like painter Lucinda Turner, who has already exhibited with the artist of the stature of John Stezica, and Andrew Grassi. Sarah Hoare is now a successful jeweler selling internationally on various online platforms. She's one of many. She graduated from our applied arts course only in June 2015 and quickly set up the successful Bird and Monkey jewellery business as part of her Level 5 Creative Futures 2 module. She is now teaching as well, delivering evening classes in jewellery, imparting her knowledge of the discipline and no doubt sharing her commercial know-how to boot. Another successful alumnus, this time from our Creative Media Technology programmes, is Andy Edgerton, who was nominated for the much-coveted Pro Sound Award. Live music changed his life and rocketed him towards a career mixing for the likes of the Wombats, the Maccabees and Mumford and Sons at some of the country's premier venues such as the Royal Festival Hall and Glastonbury. He had always attended gigs but never really thought about the work and various roles involved in putting on a live performance. He said recently, I was working in a warehouse, driving a forklift truck, wondering what to do with my life. And the answer came in the form of a live music DVD. The DVD contained interviews with the crew behind the music and prompted him to look into university courses on live studio sound. And this led him to us. Through his studies and exposure to the industry, to industry-focused teaching and learning, underpinned by staff practice and research, Andy developed a love for live sound and enjoyed the thrill of mixing. He linked the creative risks involved and the fact that you only get one shot at live sound events. There are many stories, rich in detail and real life experiences Stories about how skills have played such a vital role in our graduates succeeding in the world of employment. And I have a short film here about that too. I'm just going to play that in the background. And you'll notice some of these skills might uh, be familiar. What we all need to do more of is sharing these skills with each other, with the positive stories around the kind of things that you're doing with one another and with the world. That's my creative future, as I said, to be an advocate for you and the great work that you're doing in Wrexham. Why am I doing this? In short, to stimulate a culture of innovation and skills acquisition within and beyond the arts by developing the notion of connected communities and by demonstrating what's possible through well-designed projects and capacity building to enable the sector to innovate by providing skills, by access to skills, training, hands-on experience through our teaching and research. Secondly, because I strongly believe in collaborative partnerships. In their best form, they produce much better outcomes than could have been achieved by the individuals acting alone. 
That's because of the competition between different ideas and the rich dialogue found at the heart of the best collaborations. They also work well between organizations with arts projects and technology providers and provide a rich source of research evidence, data and case studies. And this stuff is really important to people like me. Thirdly, I wish to inspire and support the capacity of the arts sector and you as individuals to innovate and enhance, increase audience reach and engagement and develop new business models. However, the Welsh sector is a little bit behind the rest of the UK. In my view, there's quite some way to go, but that's an opportunity to me. That means there's everything to play for. There is substantial evidence across Wales and the UK which indicates that the diversity of arts audiences remains limited and that both physical and societal factors continue to act as barriers to engagement with the arts. This is where you can find a niche. These are the gaps that you need to be looking out for. There are numerous reported examples of where creative and technical thinking have been applied successfully to overcome these barriers, enabling you to secure that for yourselves forms a key part of our arts and technology strategy as a university. Another area is the arts and society. Arts activities impact on tackling poverty and disadvantage in many ways on a granular level, often through general socioeconomic processes and engagements. Detailed analysis, the analysis of these impacts is currently lacking, particularly within the Welsh context. This is another area we would like to move into with our research. One good way of doing this is through our alumni network. So we would like you to keep in touch with us and tell us about what you're doing once you've graduated and moved on. You may even find yourself being invited to come back to a future Creative Futures Week. Economic data for the arts sector in Wales shows strong growth in income and output at higher rates than the rest of the economy. However, this growth is not universal and it is likely that many organizations are contracting or drawing on reserves. So, as a gap we have identified, we should consider ways in which we can address them, if not in totality, then in part, by working as a key component of the creative industry sector through people like us, like you, developing knowledge and understanding, research and artistic practice to achieve greater audience diversity, develop arts-based interventions and to tackle poverty and disadvantage, understand more about our economic context of the arts sector and assess impact, support advocacy and promote an informed debate around the value of the arts sector to our society and economy. So, in closing, I wish you a pleasant, enjoyable and thought-provoking week, one in which you will come to own and love your own creative future. Have a great day, enjoy yourselves.
that's loud, isn't it? Um, hello, good morning. Um, my name's Jo Marsh. I'm the Arts Lead for Wrexham Council and also Creative Director of Oriel Wrexham, which is very shortly becoming t Pow, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. So this is a really exciting time for the arts in Wrexham. Um, I, you know, I think it's just an exciting time to be living and working and studying in Wrexham even. And one of the key reasons for that is that on the 2nd of April this year, we will celebrate the opening of TPAUB, a brand new market, community and art centre in the former People's Market building. So most people probably know the building. These are some photos that I took yesterday because it was just a really nice day with some blue sky for once. Um, so it's quite a prominent um, building on the other side of town um, with a multi-storey car park on top. Um, as you can see there, the, the external painting has been done, but as the construction is not quite complete, but very close to, um, the external signage has not yet been installed. So in the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to see the name T. Paub across the building as well. So T. Paub represents a really fantastic investment in Wrexham. The project has cost four and a half million pounds altogether. And that's through a combination of funding from Arts Council of Wales, Welsh Government and also Wrexham Council itself. This is just an overview image. Um, so to kind of recap what's inside TPAW, but it's not just an arts hub, which is what it's you know, largely been known as. Um, but TPAW includes 18 brand new market stalls, a food court with five cafes and a big kind of shared seating area, an indoor market square, um, which is kind of one of, the, one of the places where the arts and markets functions of the building really, really sort of overlap, because in that market square, we can have uh, live music performance, um, there might be dance performance, flash mobs, meetings and events, and also pop-up markets as well. Uh, there are two brand new gallery spaces. The larger of the two is category one specification, which means it's kind of uh, climate and humidity controlled. So we're able to bring um, things like national touring exhibitions, um, you know, kind of exhibit artworks and artifacts that require really specific conditions to be shown. And for the first time, those will be able to come to Wrexham. So it's really exciting new, new step for the arts in Wrexham. We also have a brand new gallery shop um, and a performance space. And then on the mezzanine level upstairs, there's a brand new learning studio, um, the staff offices and three rentable spaces which can be used as offices or studios. Um, and then it's all topped off, as I said, by that multi-storey car park. So just to kind of rewind a little bit, most people maybe know this story, but just in case anybody doesn't, you know, how, how did we get here? How did we get to this point? Well. Wrexham Council, I guess like councils all over the country, has needed to rethink um, the delivery of its arts provision and needed to look for a more sustainable way to maintain an arts offer in Wrexham. Um, and for us, that meant that in 2015, Oriel Wrexham Gallery moved out of the library building, um, which is where, where the gallery had been for about 43 years, formerly as Wrexham Arts Centre. So, we moved out and into these two shop units, which are on Chester Street. I guess most people have seen those. Everybody familiar with those? Yeah, okay, some nods. Um, so that, that we've been off-site since 2015. So by the time we move in um, to t Pau later in March, we'll have been off-site for three years. So that's quite kind of quite a long period to have been in an interim space. So what have we been doing while we've been off-site? Well, lots of things we haven't had um, a fixed gallery space as such but we uh, we've been delivering lots and lots of projects out in the community and kind of really trying to make the most of this of this interim phase and see what we could do differently while we're not in a fixed space so i've just put some examples of a few different things um, on the top right uh, these are some products that were part of the design and maker project that we delivered with um, advanced brighter futures a mental health charity and those were then sold in our shop, profits going back into the project. Um, the bottom right hand picture is of something called the Make Trips project. We worked with local communities um, to go and explore Wrexham County um, and, and do some creative activities while we were doing it. The bottom left hand picture is of our Art Vend project. Um, so we've commissioned, I think about 70 different artists now to make multiples of miniature artworks um, to be sold for a pound each from vending machines. This was kind of in place of having a gallery, 
we had these vending machines or we still got them that can then go, they can go anywhere, which is the great thing about them, and make a small piece of contemporary art accessible to anybody who's got a pound in their pocket and a bit of curiosity. And then we've also had, um, up until last year, our pop-up exhibition uh, programme called Periclo, uh, which, yeah, a lot of you probably came to see as well. So we've, we've, you know, we've been really busy doing, doing lots of projects and being really involved in communities in, in many different ways, um, which is all very positive, but I think it's important that we don't ignore the fact that TPAUB is opening against a backdrop of kind of lots of public anxiety and ill feeling towards the project. I put this up, this was a, an anonymous poster that was uh, blue tacked up outside one of our pop-up exhibitions. Um, yeah, it gives quite a clear message about, you know, how those particular people were feeling about, about the, the prospect of the project. And I think people have probably seen a lot of that kind of thing on social media as well. You know, I think it's been a, an anxiety that, um, you know, this has got nothing to do with Wrexham. What does it mean you're bringing an art gallery into the market? You know, people have felt that this is about the council kind of taking away another tranche of Wrexham's identity and kind of heritage as a market town. But really, you know, the truth is that this has got everything to do with Wrexham. This is not about kind of parachuting in a gallery into what was a market. We're not gluing together a gallery and a market together in the same building just because it's convenient. They're not going to be unrelated to kind of incidental neighbours. But actually what we're doing is creating something completely new and embracing markets as part of a broad cultural offer. So because of that, we felt like it was really important to do a complete rebrand of the project. You know, it was being referred to as the Arts Hub, which is kind of very misleading because, yeah, there's arts in there, but, but there's also a lot of other stuff going on in there as well. Um, and, you know, it's not really Oriel Wrexham anymore and also not really the People's Market anymore. So we felt like this project really needed a new identity, a new name. So rather than just kind of come up with something ourselves as the arts team, um, we did a big public consultation, we were, well, stakeholder consultation. This was a workshop um, that took place in Wrexham Museum. So we worked with market traders, um, with members of the arts community in Wrexham, and a kind of a range of other local stakeholders as well, um, to really sort of dig into, you know, what, what is this new development going to offer? What does it need to be? Who is it for? What's it about? Um, worked really hard over the course of a day. Um, and as part of that, we, we got to a short list of three potential names for what ended up being TPAUB. So, so out of the three names, they then went to a completely public vote so people could vote on social media um, and also in community resource centers and different public buildings, people were able to come and physically put a vote in a box. And the name that came out on top was TPAUB, which obviously means everybody's house. Um, and then we've got the strapline markets, community arts, to go with it. So I thought it'd just be kind of good to look at the, the key values that came out um, of that workshop. And these were the things that, that people felt were the really important values for TPAUB. So yeah, useful, inclusive, innovative, creative, togetherness, Welsh, quality and responsive. So all of these, all of these values fed into, into the new name as well. And I think it's important to say that, you know, these are the values that we, that we are holding as the most important for TPAL, but also we fit into a kind of broader, a broader trajectory in terms of the way the arts are developing um, worldwide. So a few examples of kind of key reference points and precedents for TPAL. Uh, the top right is an image from MIMA, Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art, um, which calls itself the Useful Museum. So again, that, that word useful, um, you know, and they're, they're working really hard to find ways to kind of tangibly be of benefit to the communities in Teesside. And that's something that we're taking as a really fantastic example to follow. The Arte Util movement, which is very interesting to look into if, if you have time. Um, so Arte Util, useful art, um, so as the, the description there says, roughly translates into English as useful art, but it goes further suggesting art as a tool or device. Arte Util draws on artistic thinking to imagine 
create and implement tactics that change how we act in society. So that really chimes with everything we want to achieve through the programme at TPAUB. And then also just, yeah, a, a really great example um, of how a project can be completely locally rooted and very tangibly beneficial to a community, uh, but can still be groundbreaking and achieve international acclaim um, is the Granby Four Streets project um, by Assemble, which won the Turner Prize in 2015. So just to show that, you know, we're not, we're not kind of working in, in a vacuum, we're, we're part of something bigger. So, the TPAL mission statement, this has taken a long time to develop and obviously grew out of that consultation process and working with stakeholders. I guess this is, you know, setting out what we want to do. TPAL will be a cultural community resource bringing together arts and markets within the same footprint. This coexistence will celebrate the significance of markets within Wrexham's cultural heritage and identity. The development will be a new space for dialogue around subjects including social and civic issues, the environment, health, cultural identity, sustainability and education. We will present a contemporary programme of welcoming and inclusive exhibitions, socially engaged projects and live performance. The programme will emphasise skills and craft, working with emerging and established artists from all backgrounds. So, I'm just going to go into some of the ways that we are bringing that mission statement into being. Um, firstly, the Wild Pow Commission, which again, people might have seen this, this advertised. It was an open call, went out quite widely on social media. Um, the, the, uh, it'd be good if I had an Im another image of the, of the centre to show you, but if you can imagine um, the, the wall between Gallery 1, the, bit, the, the larger gallery and the market hall, we're calling that Wild Pow, but it feels like a very significant kind of wall in, in terms of the building because it literally is between the market and the arts. Um, so on that wall, we've got um, two tri-vision billboards. So if you can imagine, I guess they're quite old fashioned now, um, these billboards that are in, the image is cut into strips and it kind of flicks. So there's three, three images and it flicks between them. And um, so this is our, our Well Power Commission. Every year we'll be changing this and commissioning an artist to create some work that explores in some way that overlap, that coexistence of arts and markets. So the very first Well Power Commission is going to be installed very soon. Um, we did an open call, had some fantastic responses. Um, the successful artist was Katie Cudden. And the images below are of her um, in, in Wrexham's market. So that's in the butcher's market. And then also um, with an artist in Wrexham. So, so Katie came, you know, we didn't just say, can you create some imagery for us. It was really about working with the markets community and with the arts community to kind of unpack some of those ideas around coexistence and what might it mean for us all to be operating within the same space. So in Katie's case, that meant coming doing studio visits with artists, speaking to market traders. Um, yeah, so we're, we're very soon gonna, gonna find out what that artwork looks like. Um, and then that will be up for a year. So on the 2nd of April when we open, with a chance to see that work. Thinking about the programme, uh, the arts programme at TPAUB more broadly, so um, as the creative director, my background isn't particularly curatorial, but more, um, I was the learning and engagement officer at Oriel Wrexham. I've worked a lot, a lot in education and, and with Engage as well. Um, and we've, we've, I guess ordinarily, with, with somewhere like TPAW, when you've got a big gallery space, there would be the exhibition program is the thing that you plan first. That's kind of the leading, the leading force for everything. And then your public program, your education program would follow on from that. And whatever's in your shop, your kind of retail and applied arts would follow on from that as well. But we're doing things slightly differently at TPAW um, and that we're seeing it more as three equal reciprocal parts. So it's not always exhibition programme first. Very often it will be our public programme. So the work that we're doing with people, with communities, the, the issues that we're identifying that feed into our public programme, well, we'll develop exhibitions to follow on from those. And equally, uh, in terms of retail and applied arts, obviously we have our shop currently on Chester Street 
and we will still have a shop when we move into TPAOB. And we're really seeing that as a vehicle for programme delivery rather than an add-on. So our shop, as well as just selling really beautiful things, like most gallery shops, also delivers projects. So for example, um, the Design and Maker project, we'll be continuing that and working um, for the next two years with the prison, with the new prison, HMP Berwyn, and working with the men to develop products which go on sale in the shop, um, and any, any profits that are made go back into being able to keep that project sustainable. Um, and I guess this, the D Clean Power project is a really good example of how public program can feed into exhibition program and retail program as well. Um, so D Clean Power, I guess, have you, has anybody heard about D Clean Power? No, not getting much response. So, so D Clean Power means everybody's Monday. Um, and our opening event on the 2nd of April is D Clean Power. It's a big celebration, but it's not just been about the one day. For about 18 months now, um, as part of the D Clean Power project, we've been working with communities in Wrexham, meeting lots of different people and gathering stories about Wrexham, things that people can remember, and perhaps you know more unusual, lesser known stories about Wrexham, like one that always sticks in my mind is about how there's apparently tons of Lego buried underneath the old Lego building, because when they closed the factory, it was like too expensive to take it away or something. So it's things like that that are kind of interesting, nice, nice stories about Wrexham. Now, the reason we've been gathering all those stories, I mean, it's a nice process in and of itself, um, but all of that was leading to our souvenirs project. So of all the stories collected, we eventually did a public vote and six were chosen. And we've now commissioned six artists, one being Martha Todd, who you can see in the bottom right hand corner. Um, and the six artists are all in the process of designing and developing prototype souvenirs for Wrexham. There's never been a Wrexham specific souvenir, apparently, um, apart from things that, you know, they're like generic and you stamp the name of whatever town you're in onto it. So, for example, um, Martha is doing some work around, around football um, and will be developing a souvenir specific to Wrexham out of the story that she had. So that's, that's about a public programme really feeding into our retail programme because ultimately those souvenirs will be sold in the, in the, in the shop at TPAW. And also um, the whole TPAW, the whole Deathly Power project, which includes lots of workshops many, many workshops. I think there might be people here who've led workshops for us as part of that project. Um, kind of documentation of that, as well as the souvenirs themselves, will all be in an exhibition later this year at TPAOB. So just to kind of try and illustrate how that, how that three-part reciprocal program is gonna work. I think that's a good example. Our opening exhibition um, is, is This Planet Earth. It's a group show. We've worked with an independent curator, Angela Kingston, and it's really focused on environmental issues and sustainability. Um, there's a combination of there's some Welsh artists and some sort of national and international artists as well. So in terms of the mission statement, you know, and how we're bringing that into being, making a space for dialogue, um, we're working with um, the Centre for Alternative Technologies in McCunthliffe, who are coming over to do a series of events um, in conversation groups to kind of unpack some of the issues that are raised um, by the exhibition. And, you know, from our point of view, it would be really great if there were some, some kind of people who meet and then even a group that can continue, continue to meet after the exhibition's finished. We want it to be a kind of catalyst for ongoing activity. We've also got a local artist in residence as part of the exhibition, Tim Pugh. Um, and we've worked on a, on a collaborative a collaborative artwork with the people of Wrexham, I guess, we issued an open call for people to send in landscape photographs of Wrexham. And we had a really fantastic response. I think we've had about 60 photographs sent in, um, which is always, I think, amazing when you ask people to get involved, and then they do. Um, so so all, these, all these photographs will be, um, will be kind of compiled into, into, a, into a, I guess, like a patchwork of landscape images. Um, and that'll be part of the exhibition as well. So really fantastic that as part of the opening exhibition at TPAOB, there's a collaborative piece of work that's been done by the people of Wrexham. Baggy space. So this is, um, I've put up an image of the centre again because the, the notion of baggy space actually comes from our architects who've worked on TPAOB, Featherstone Young. 
and they talk about um, some of the spaces in TPAL being kind of less defined, so there's, there's room for unexpected things to happen, and it's not, you know, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen in there every day. If I try and use this little light, the flexible space, the market square is one of the baggy spaces, and then also the kind of walkway coming in from Market Street is very wide, and all down here. So, so it's about this idea of there being, yeah, literally baggy space, space for the unexpected to happen. Ooh. What do I do? It's gone off. I'm just going to keep talking. Um, so we've, um, we have kind of appropriated that term baggy space, I guess, to describe something we want to do within the exhibition program as well. So because of the way that we're funded, we have to program up to three years in advance. Um, you know, just because of logistics as well, it takes a long time to put an exhibition together. But what that doesn't give you is any kind of space to be responsive to things that are happening more immediately. You know, we want to be able to respond to current urgencies and issues and concerns um, that are happening in Wrexham. So what we've done is built in, I, I nearly finished, I think it'll be all right. Don't worry, I'll just, I'll just talk. You'll have to use your imagination. Um, we built in some slots in between the programmed exhibitions um, called Baggy Spaces, or maybe they're going to have a different name, this is the working title, um, that we won't fill those slots until maybe a month or two before, before they happen. And yeah, we're working on the way to publicise those, but I guess that's, that's one way that all of you might be able to potentially get involved at TPAL. Um, it could be exhibitions of artwork, but it might just be about framing a really important conversation that needs to happen within the gallery space, or like an intensive dance rehearsal, um, you know, just whatever it is that, that could do with the space and the spotlight being shined on it in Wrexham. So look out for the Baggy Space programme, which will be coming soon. Uh, I'm going to skip through because you can't see any images. Um, so partnership working, that was something I wanted to, you know, really say strongly that TPAO is opening against a backdrop of a growing cultural momentum in Wrexham. You know, the art scene in Wrexham has changed dramatically since I moved to Wrexham in 2011. We're not on our own, we're not in isolation. You know, we've got some fantastic partners in the, the School of Creative Arts in Wrexham. We have the Regional Print Centre, which is a really fantastic facility. And then not to mention Ian Degeen. I guess everybody knows Ian Degeen as well. Um, so, you know, having affordable studio space has really been a game changer in Wrexham. I'm a studio holder at Ian Degeen and have been since it opened. And we're developing lots of partnership projects, um, you know, in many different ways. And I think that's, that's where the strength is in Wrexham is that we're really good at working together and that's what we need to maintain. Lots of opportunities for you to get involved in what we're doing, and I'm going to be coming back tomorrow afternoon. I can't remember what time, but if you have a look in the programme, I'll be able to tell you a bit more specifically about the things you can get involved with. Um, and so finally, just to say, please, please come along on the 2nd of April to Deethleen Paub, the celebratory opening of Tea Paub. Um, it starts at midday. There's going to be a big parade going through the town centre, um, and then lots of live music. It'll be a chance to see the exhibition. Um, and just, yeah, come and have a look, have a look at the new building. And we're really looking forward to working alongside you all um, as the creative future of Wrexham unfolds. It's interesting when, uh, when technology fails, humans keep going. Um, so what we're going to do now is have a short 15 minute break just to kind of stretch your legs and refresh. So if you all come back here at 20 past or just gone 20 past, we'll reconvene. So 10, 15 minute break please, be prompt. <laughs> <laughs>